Well, it's time for us to look together into the Word of God and for us to have the Word of God wash our minds and our hearts. We have now completed our series uh, on the miracles of Christ in the Gospel of John, and I have said what I feel the Lord would have me to say. And I want to bring just an isolated message that has nothing to do with where we are, but I think is very important for the spiritual life of this church. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And today I want us to look at verses 8 and 9. The title of this message is The Battle for the Mind. Of course, I want to begin by reading the text, the passage that will be the focus of our exposition in this message And I want to underscore how greatly everyone in this house of worship needs to hear this message. It begins with me as the pastor. My mind must be at a certain place and of a certain condition if I'm to be the pastor that you need. And for your own spiritual life, as your mind goes, so will go the entirety of your spiritual life. Philippians chapter 4, I want to read verses 8 and 9. This is our focus this Lord's day. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, Dwell on these things. The things you have learned, verse 9, and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. John Stott, the noted London British pastor and author who recently died at the age of 90, has written, quote, The battle of the Christian life, how would you complete that sentence? The battle of the Christian life is the battle for the Christian mind, close quote. How critically important it is that our minds are fixed and filled with that which is right and proper and true. The way your Christian life works is What comes into your mind affects your heart or your affections. And all of the decisions and choices that you make are actually determined by your affections. Every choice that you make is the choice that you want to make. And what is governing and controlling your desires is what is feeding into your mind. Uh, Your will is simply the handmaiden of your affections. As your affections go, so will go your will. That was the central theme of Jonathan Edwards' book, The Freedom of the Will, which R.C. Sproul says is the greatest book ever to be written on American soil and in any century. And what is controlling your affections is your mind. Garbage in garbage out. Truth and purity in, truth and purity out. Solomon said it so long ago in Proverbs 23 verse 7, for as a man thinks within himself, so is he. The reality of your Christian life, the sum and the substance of it, is really what you are thinking inside your mind. High thoughts of God lead to high living and high worship and and a, a high and noble life. And low thoughts of God, quite frankly, lead to trivial living. Ultimately, it can lead to gutter living. But as your mind goes, so goes your life. And therefore, our minds are critically important in the Christian life. They are the, uh, the initial front line of the battlefield upon which our Christian life is being contested. 
Romans 12, verse 2, Paul writes, Do not be conformed to this world. That means do not be squeezed into the mold and into the thinking of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The only way we can be transformed from the inside out is by the renewing of our minds. Control your thoughts. And it will govern the direction of your life and the decisions that you make. Ephesians 4, verse 23, Paul writes, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that is an ongoing uh, process that must be taking place. Continually and constantly, we must be renewing and elevating our mind. Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. How important is our mind to our spiritual growth in grace? 1 Peter 1, verse 13, Peter commands all believers and he calls, commands us, Prepare your minds for actions. In other words, you're not ready for anything in your Christian life until you first prepare your mind. Paul writes in Colossians 3 and verse 2, Set your minds on things above and not on things on the earth. It is this emphasis upon the mind and our inner thought life that Paul underscores in these verses. This text calls for thinking pure, godly thoughts. Before we look at this text, let me put it this way. You will become like what you are thinking about. Like produces like. Filthy thoughts produce a filthy life. It's inevitable. There, there's no end run around that. And godly thoughts inevitably lead to a godly life. And what Paul says here in Philippians 4 verse 8 is a call for pure thoughts and right thinking. And these verses really provide a grid and a template over what we should allow be, to be put in front of our eyes, what we should allow to enter into our ears, what we should allow inside our mind. Legalism would be for me to give you a long list of what that is. And the Bible never does that. But what the Bible does give is the guardrails that should be on the perimeter of the narrow path that we live, upon which we live. And these verses really are a grid and a template that should be an overlay for our daily lives. And these verses really provide the parameters for television watching, for movie attending, for music listening, for computer surfing, for magazine looking, for book browsing, for concert attending. The Bible is the most relevant book that has ever been written. It addresses the important issues of our lives. And there is no way that we can be one person here on Sunday morning and hear the exposition of the Word of God and then go back to our homes or go back to our dorm rooms or go back to wherever it is we are and allow other things to be coming into our minds and assume that, you know, I'm bulletproof and my Christian life will just continue on a very high path. No, Solomon wrote in Proverbs, Can a man take a fire into his bosom and be not burned? It's a rhetorical question implying the obvious answer to any thinking human being that if you take fire into you, you're going to be burned. Even grace does not uh, separate a cause and effect relationship. So today, I really want to address us on the pursuit of holiness. I want to address us on the pursuit of godliness. 
Because our church will be a great church in the eyes of God in large measure to the extent that we are a church that is pursuing godliness and holiness. I want to work through this text. I'm trusting that I'll have time to work through it. But I don't want to leave anything on the table. I want you to note first, beginning in verse 8, the people addressed. Verse 8 begins, finally, brethren. It becomes very obvious to us that what follows in verses 8 and 9 is directed to all the brethren. You can see that in your own Bible. All Christians and all believers in all places, in all generations, on all continents are being addressed. You and I are being addressed. We are a part of the brethren. What follows is not merely for some of the brethren or for new brethren or for female brethren or male brethren. No, this is addressed to each and every one of us who are born into the family of God, born again. And God has given us a new mind. The moment that we were converted to Christ. He has given us the mind of Christ. And it is incumbent upon each and every one of us that as we have now received a a new mind, that we guard this mind and we sit and watch over this mind. So the people addressed is the brethren. That would be you and me. Second, I want you to note the purity required. As we continue to look at verse 8, he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there is one drop of excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, This and this alone is what you are to dwell on. Dwell on these things. I want to begin by commenting on the end of verse 8, dwell on these things. When he says this, the word dwell on means to think about, to be focused upon mentally. He's saying, think on these things, focus on these things, set your mind on these things. It will be important for us to know today that this verb is a command, it's an imperative. God is commanding us to dwell on these things. This is not optional for any believer in this room. This is not just true for the teenagers here today. This is not true just for those in their 20s here today. This is not just true for those who are in the middle of life. It's true for across the board for every Christian here today, and it comes as an apostolic order. This word dwell is a Greek word. I'm going to pronounce it only because you will hear the English word inside of it. Legizomai. You can hear logarithms or logic in this verb. When you do logarithms, you're going to have to think. And you're going to have to fix your mind. It's a, this is a mathematical term. And carries the idea of careful calculation and study. Something that requires great concentration Uh, The word means to to take into account. And it's come down to us in the Scripture to mean to think very carefully about, to reckon, to evaluate, to consider. And what Paul is saying to the Philippians and to us is believers are to mentally focus on and intellectually dwell upon certain things that fit within the parameters of what is lawful and what is proper and what is right. 
Also, we need to know that dwell on, that verb, dwell on these things is in the present tense, meaning 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we are to be ever and always dwelling on these things. There's never a day off from dwelling on these things. There's never a sabbatical from dwelling on these things. This is a constant, ongoing lifestyle. It, is, it requires continuous activity every moment of every day. We must be always dwelling on these things. We must be habitually thinking about these things. Now, these things at the end of verse 8 are the things that he has just mentioned previously as he has carefully defined in the immediate, in the preceding part of this verse, what is a green light for us. Outside of this is a red light, not even a blinking yellow light, it's a red light. You've left the highway outside of what these eight things require. And so I want us to, to walk through this list as Paul catalogs eight godly virtues which should govern what we set before our eyes, what we allow into our ears, what we read, what we allow to be our entertainment. So let's begin to look at this list. These mark the parameters of a wholesome thought life of one who is growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. With that, without these in place, one will be spiritually stunted at best or be spiritually devastated at worst. He begins by saying, whatever is true. That's what your mind needs to be fixed upon. Whatever is true. This word for true means real, genuine. It means authentic, that which is reliable, that which is faithful, as distinguished from that which is false or that which is a lie. He's saying, do not let your mind be focused upon that which is a distortion of the divine standard, that which is a, a compromise of what God clearly lays out in His Word. And the reason that he says this is that focusing upon what is true leads inevitably to true Christianity and results in authentic godliness. But dwelling upon what is false, the, the antithesis of what is true, dwelling upon what is false leads to false Christianity and pseudo-growth in grace. If you dwell upon a lie, your life will live a lie. If you dwell upon what is a deception, your life will become a deception. Second, whatever is honorable. This refers to what is worthy of respect. This word honorable means noble, of high and lofty quality dignified, that which is revered, majestic, august, the very opposite of what is honorable would be that which is dishonorable in the eyes of God. Paul is saying, get your mind off low base things and focus your mind upon lofty, honorable things. Get your mind out of the gutter, Paul is saying. Get your mind off of trivial, frivolous things. Put your mind on high, lofty, elevated, heavenly, 
transcendent things that pull you up, that don't take you down. Think about those things that are ethically pure and meet a very high standard by God's Word. Think about those things that are principled, that are decent, that are moral, morally good, that are upstanding and that are upright. Focusing upon what is honorable leads to honoring God. Focusing upon what is honorable leads to living an honorable life, a respectable life, a blameless life. But dwelling upon that which is dishonorable dishonors God. It's all a battle for the mind. Be careful what you allow behind the steering wheel of your mind because it will take you perhaps somewhere you do not intend to go. Third, whatever is right. The word right here means that which conforms to God's standard. It's the idea, same root word of righteousness. It's the idea of uh, of really scales and a balance, and, and with scales, and you put a balance on one side of the scales, and you pour out grain into the other side of the scale until the scales are, are balanced. That's the idea here with the word right or righteousness. And on one side of the scales is the holiness of God's pure character. And on the other side of the scales is our mind, and what goes into our minds needs to be that which is in proportion to the holiness of God. All other things are not right. This refers to that which is in harmony with God's holy character and God's holy being. Now, this word right, whatever is right, refers to that which is proper that which is law-abiding, squares with Scripture, is trustworthy, fair. It doesn't mean that we can only think about the Bible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but whatever else we're thinking about outside of the Bible needs to square with the Bible and not contradict what the Scripture clearly lays out. If we focus upon what is right, we will live right. And conversely, if we focus upon what is wrong, we will live wrong. And there is this inseparable connection between what we think about and how we live. Right thoughts produce right living. It's that simple. Wrong thoughts produce wrong living. We cannot focus upon what is wrong and expect to live right. It just can't happen. The deposits that are being made into our mind are yielding a compound return with our withdrawals. Fourth, whatever is pure. I'm sure the church at Philippi would have loved for Paul to have gone ahead and stated for them a long list of, you can go hear this orator, but you cannot go to this theater. Uh, you could go to this festival, but you cannot do this. They would have loved to have had it all spelled out. The only problem is those things are just in constant flux and are constantly changing. And so what Paul provides here are timeless, transcendent principles that stretch over the centuries, that stretch over the cultures, that stretch over the continents, that are applicable and relevant for every one of us here today. He says, whatever is pure. Uh, this word for pure comes from the same root word that is translated holy or holiness. Here it refers to ethical purity, moral purity. Fill your minds with what is pure and holy. 
that which is wholesome, virtuous, unstained by the world's corruptions, unblemished by fallen man. This word refers to what is not mixed with immorality, moral impurities. This refers to that which is uncontaminated by man's depravity, that which is unmixed with filth, that which is not adulterated with moral corruption, that which is flawless, that which has been filtered or censored. If we are to live a pure life, then we must dwell upon things that are pure. Do you want to live a pure life? It's an open-ended question. Do you want to live a pure life? How pure of a life do you want to live? Marginally pure? Or actually pure? Then that necessitates that we dwell upon whatever is pure. If we are to live a pure life, we must dwell upon those things that are pure, but if we dwell upon what is impure, given enough time, we will live an impure life because we have become impure. Fifth, whatever is lovely. He continues to, to expand this, and, and with each one of these descriptives that he adds, he, he is really putting a fence around that which we ought to be allowing in our minds and giving fuller definition. Whatever is lovely. Now, this word lovely speaks of that which is pleasing, attractive that which reflects beauty, the beauty of holiness, ethical beauty. It represents that which is sweet and gracious and generous, not that which is raw and crude and ugly. It is that which is beautiful in the eyes of those who are pure. We as believers must focus our thoughts on what the Bible says is pleasing to God, that which is attractive to God, that which promotes peace. To the contrary, the world attempts to seduce us and hoodwink us and bait the hook to pull us into that which is unlovely and that which is unattractive to be adorned by any believer. Six, whatever is of good repute. Uh, the word here for good repute means to be highly regarded. It literally means fair speaking or good speaking. It is that which is well spoken of by God and by God's Word. That which is morally attractive and should be spoken highly of. It refers to that which is reputable, that which is respectable, that which is credible. The very opposite of this would be like Ephesians 5 verse 4, which warns against what this verse says, Ephesians 5 4. Let there be no filthiness or silly talk or crude jesting be named among you, which is not fitting. It's just not fitting. It, it's, it's, it's not fitting for anyone who has a high and holy calling upon their lives. Number seven, he says, if there is any excellence. These final two marks really provide something of a, of a summation. They, they begin, if there is, if there is and really have kind of a, a, a bottom-line summation feel to it. If there is 
any excellence, anything of mental excellence, anything of, of moral excellence, anything that is virtuous, anything that reflects high moral standards, anything that reflects that which squares with and reflects the holiness of Almighty God. He will say, dwell on these things. That which is morally excellent and pleasing to God. Only dwelling upon that which is excellent will lead to living an excellent life. Such a simple proposition to set before you. If you dwell upon that which is excellent, you will live a spiritually excellent life. It's just a matter of time until it saturates the whole of your being and fills your affections and your heart and then directs your will, but it all starts at the highest level and then it's a trickle-down effect. If there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, that which is to be commended before God, that which is to be applauded in the presence of God, and not to be uh, applauded in some frat house or sorority house in the, the midst of a, of, of a dark time, not some back room alley applause, but that which can be applauded in the pure light of the Holiness of Almighty God, that's what you need to let your mind be set upon. William Hendrickson, the great commentator, writes on, on this, nothing that is really worthwhile for believers to ponder and take into consideration is omitted from this summarizing phrase. In other words, he says it's comprehensive here. If it doesn't pass this test, turn it off. If it doesn't pass this test, close your computer. If it doesn't pass this test, you're not going to that concert, you're not going to that place, you're not reading that book, or you are inviting trouble for your life. He goes on to say anything at all that is a matter of moral and spiritual excellence, so that it is the proper object of praise is the right pasture for the Christian mind to graze in. In other words, by this imagery, everything within these eight descriptives just come on into this pasture and eat and graze if it passes this test. If not, you're eating rocks and stone and dirt and filth and trash. And it will affect your spiritual life. Hendrickson then concludes, it's a very emphatic statement. He may be one of the all-time most trusted commentators that God has given to the church. In fact, as I look out, I see a, a couple who comes down from Michigan who I've preached in that pulpit where William Hendrickson preached. Nothing that is of a contrary nature is the right food for thought. If it, doesn't hit, if it does not meet this test, it should be off limits to the believer. Now, here's our problem. One, we live in a world that is just inundating us with so many stimuli and so many signals and so many messages that are contrary to this. That's one problem. I mean, we're swimming in a, in a cesspool of iniquity, the likes of which civilization has never faced. The access now to moral filth, to immorality, is, is unprecedented. Just carrying around a cell phone, you can pull up anything and everything and have the wrong stuff coming into your mind. Cable TV, where you can have hundreds of options. Surfing the Internet. 
we're going to have to be on guard. We're going to have to set up a firewall around us or we're going to get burned. And we're fools to think it could be any other way. And some parents wonder why their kids went astray and where did that all begin? I'll tell you where it began. It began with the mind. That didn't come out of thin air. It came into the mind. And somehow, somewhere along the way, there was put into the mind filthy, crude, raw thoughts. And it, and it came back in a harvest of immorality. And it grieves me those who continue to stress grace, 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 grace. Well, I love God's grace, but I'm going to tell you, you're going to get burned and there are going to be memories for the rest of your life. The mind is a powerful thing. So all these eight characteristics define what our minds should be dwelling on. One, this certainly begins with Scripture, does it not? Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. Two, this certainly is true about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the embodiment and the incarnation of all these things. Set your mind on Christ. Look to Christ. Love Him with all your mind. Three, whatever in everyday life meets this mark is acceptable. Four, whatever in the world falls short of this grid is unacceptable. It would be better for you to take a dropper with cyanide in it and just drop some drops into a glass of water and drink it. That would only destroy your body. But the real you is the soul within your body. Let us guard our minds because we will soon become like that upon which we are thinking. Third, the pattern followed. How do we put this into practice? What does this look like? I want you to note verse 9. Verse 9 is inseparably connected to verse 8. Do you see how verse 9 begins? The things. Do you see how verse 8 concluded on these things? There, there is a bridge from verse 8 to verse 9. One of the most noted commentators, Peter T. O'Brien, writes at this point, it is inappropriate to drive a wedge between verse 8 and verse 9. And there is a direct connection between the things at the end of verse 8 and the things at the beginning of verse 9. And O'Brien adds, verse 9 is closely conjoined with the preceding. And so the Philippians are to be those who emulate Paul. Look at verse 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. So Paul is calling the Philippians to imitate him to follow his example specifically of that which he wrote in verse 8. And they should pattern their lives after what Paul sets before his eyes and what Paul says and how Paul lived. Now, you'll note in verse 9 there, there are four things that they are to put into practice that they see in Paul's life, what they have learned, what they have received, what they have heard, and what they have seen. This is how they are to implement verse 8. Paul is to be the poster child of this before the watching eyes of the Philippians. So what do the, each of these distinctives mean? The things you have learned 
That is what Paul taught them and preached to them when Paul was there. The things that they received refer to what Paul wrote to them. Even this epistle and this letter, the things that they heard is what they heard about Paul from others. Others who were there with Paul and what they observed in Paul's life, how he's responding to this Roman imprisonment in which he finds himself, how Paul is responding to adversity, how Paul is responding to, to unjust suffering. Is Paul retaliating with vindictives, or is Paul leaving it in the hands of God and turning the other cheek and responding with grace to those who would curse him? That, that news is, is spreading like, like wildfire and has come all the way to, to Philippi, and the report that they are hearing about Paul in Roman imprisonment and how Paul is living his life, how Paul is conducting himself. Is Paul being drugged down, or is Paul continuing to live above the fray and live a high and holy life? Whatever the message is that is coming to them, Paul is confident enough to say, you need to mimic me. And then he adds, and seen, the things that you have seen, uh, those things that Paul modeled in their presence, uh, that which they observed in Paul's life. He underscores the fact that it is what they see in him, because in this Next prepositional phrase, he says, in me. It's crystal clear. What they see in Paul's life, what they see in Paul's attitudes, what they see in Paul's actions, what they see in Paul's walk, what they see in Paul's talk. Paul is saying, you need to live like me. More than that, he says, practice these things. It's in the imperative mood, it is a command. It is in the present tense, it is to be an ongoing patterning of their lives after Paul. The word practice means to do, to execute, to, to perform. And he is saying, you need to live in a manner consistent with my life and with my teaching. Paul has modeled his own message and become a visible example to the Philippians of how they should live in their pursuit of holiness. And so it is in the local church. Those who are pastors and those who are elders in the church are the shepherds of the flock. And you should imitate what you see in their life to the extent that they are truly following Christ. You need to keep your eyes on them. You need to keep your ears open to them because they will be a guide to you how to live in a God-honoring way. Now, someone might argue and say, well, isn't this egotistical on Paul's part? Or isn't this promoting a man? Isn't this putting a, a man ahead a of Christ? Well, I want you to turn, if you would, back to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. And we covered this when we preached through the book of 1 Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, Paul clearly writes, here are a lot of pages, that's good. I exhort you, I plead with you, I beseech you, I entreat you, I exhort you, be imitators of me. So it is critically important, the spiritual life of the one that you're following. Come to chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, now it becomes even more clear. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, Paul says, I'll give you just a moment. Paul writes, be 
imitators of me, and now the qualifier, just as I also am of Christ. You need to have spiritual leaders who are following Christ. You need to have spiritual leaders who, who exert an influence by how they live and what they say because you need to have your eyes on them and be following their example as they are an incarnation of what God is requiring of your life. In other words, he's saying it's as much caught as it is taught. Uh, this word imitator is a Greek word. I'm going to say it because you can hear the English word in it. Mimites, mimites, mimic. You're to be a copycat. You are to mimic the priorities and the passions and the life and the attitudes of those whom God has placed before you. Come back to Philippians. Turn to Philippians 3 and verse 17. Philippians 3 and verse 17. He begins this just as he does Philippians 4, verse 8, brethren. This is an in-house discussion among believers. Brethren. And when he says brethren, there, there's a pleading in his, in his voice that comes through his pen. Brethren, join in following my example. And he says, and it's not just me, he goes on to say, and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Those who are imitating us very closely, you are to walk in that same manner. You know what this is called? This is called discipleship. Luke 6, verse 40, Jesus said, Everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. So, how were the Philippians to know how to put this in practice? How were they to implement in their own spiritual lives by how they observe how they see, how they read, how they hear about their own spiritual leaders. Which is why God places such a high moral standard on those who would be elders and shepherds in the flock, because everyone else is to copy them and mimic them. Now, finally, What's the result of this? Come back to Philippians 4, verse 9. What's the result of this? We've seen the people addressed, the purity required. We've seen the third heading, the pattern followed. I want you to see the peace enjoyed. <laughs> this leads to blessing in your life. You know, it's the devil who says, God's holding out on you. If you confine your thought life to this which is pure and right, uh, God's really holding out on you. Well, that's exactly what he said to Eve. Has God said that you can't eat from all the trees? No, God didn't even say that. But God is so good, God withheld the poison of other things to preserve the spiritual health and prosperity by confining yourself to what he says is lawful and desirable. And so it is for the Philippians, and so it is for us, that if you will let your mind dwell on these things, and if you will imitate the spiritual examples that are set before you in the church, this is what it leads to. This is the fruit. This is the result. He says, and, and the idea of the and is, it inseparably leads to this. And, we could say, and then. And the God of peace will be with you. This is referring to the subjective peace of God. 
This is referring to not peace with God, but the peace of God in our own hearts and in our own souls and lives. God has all peace. There is, no, there is not a drop of peace for any human soul in the world outside of receiving it from God Himself. He is the God of all peace. And He will be with you And the idea, as Paul writes this, is that God will be with you to give you His peace. Paul has just addressed this subject just three verses earlier. Look at verses 6 and 7. Remember, we study the Bible in context. Location, location, location. Notice what has immediately preceded verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and this is what it leads to, and then the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He's saying, if you will commit everything to the Lord in prayer, you will have His peace. And he is also saying in verse 8, if you will keep your mind clean and pure, you will also have this peace. It surpasses all comprehension. And the implication very clearly is, the day sin moves in, peace moves out. Because sin and peace cannot coexist in the same mind and in the same heart at the same time. And when sin comes in and is invited in and it begins to soil and and blemish the inner life, peace will not hang around. Peace will pack its bags and move out and move without leaving a forwarding address. And it will lead to discouragement. It will lead to, to, to loss of joy. It will lead to depression. And instead, that, or that person has one of two choices. Either I repent, I confess my sin, and when we do, peace moves back in. But if we don't do that, what we do is we want a higher buzz. We want more uh, of the thrill. So if we don't repent and if we don't confess, we're going to push the fences out a little bit more to have the, the temporary pleasure of sin that Hebrews 11 talks about. And there is a temporary pleasure to sin. And it is a false joy. It is a a fraudulent joy. But there is a buzz in the moment. And then the conscience is convicted and accused. And there is guilt. And rightly so. Praise God for the guilt people feel. That's like pain to the body. It tells you, you have a broken ankle. Stop. I was driving in from the airport last night from Pensacola. No more got out of town in the middle of nowhere, and the flashing lights come on. Cool it out. Stop ASAP. There's a sense in which that was bad news. But in reality, that was the best thing for me to hear because if I had kept on driving, my car would have gone up in flames. It was smoking as it was. That's what guilt brings to the soul. It tells you, stop, A-S-A-P, stop. You're killing yourself. Pull over. But if you don't pull over, if you don't repent, if you don't confess, and if you push down on the gas pedal, you're going to blow up your life. But if you will set your mind on what is true and what is right, and if you will follow the example of godly men, the God of peace will be with you. That's a promise. And no one here is above the rules. No one here does this not work for them. This is here for every church, for every believer, 
in every decade, in every century, on every continent, till Jesus comes back. So how important do you think your mind is? How important do you think the battle for your mind is? And you wonder, well, where did so-and-so lose it? I'll tell you exactly. It started in the mind. Something entered the mind. Something was allowed come into the mind that was not wholesome. It wasn't pure. It wasn't excellent. It wasn't worthy of praise. It was morally loathsome. And peace moves out. And the pursuit of sin accelerates. I want to conclude this message where I began. The battle of the Christian life is the battle of the Christian mind. You will become like what fills your mind. Godly thoughts will produce godly living. Holy thoughts will lead to holy living. But conversely, base thoughts will lead to base living. So guard your mind. Set your mind on the written Word of God. Set your mind on the living Word of God. And the most powerful word in your vocabulary today just may be no. And to just walk away or turn it off. And for the purity of the mind to be preserved. This is every believer's responsibility. God must give us the grace to do it. For temptation is strong, is it not? But nevertheless... The responsibility lies at the feet of every believer in the body of Christ. Brethren, we must live in a distinctly pure and godly way.